Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to design the most important part of our 2400 watt UPS. We're about to set this whole thing up for either success or failure. Today is the critical day that will have the largest role in determining the success or failure of this entire project. Today is either going down in fame or infamy. Are we designing the new inverter? No. Am I talking about finishing the PFC design? No. Is it the main board circuit? No, uh, still no. It's not a circuit. The most important part of this UPS is the architecture. This architecture will define how the different functions link together, define power limits, and put some structure around the critical interfaces in the system. The architecture we're building today is the reference that we're going to design all of our boards around. For those among us that haven't designed a relatively big system like this before, you may be tempted to just click off this video, like boring, skip, and if every project that you ever do fits on one board, uses one microcontroller, and never does anything safety critical, you may not find what we need to talk about today very interesting. But I want to challenge the attention span of the average human today. I want to show you through leading by example how to design something big, and it all starts with architecture. The fundamental problem with designing something big is that it takes time. Time is a wonderful gift that we all get each and every day, but it has some pros and cons. The positive side of time is that we can use it to do great things, like design fun projects. The negative side of time is that we can forget stuff. It's especially difficult to hold on to tiny details about small decisions that we made a long time ago. I promise that I'm getting to a point here, and that point is, if I, one person, if I as one person try to design our whole UPS, the main board, three daughter cards, and a bunch of power supplies and software to boot, by the time I got done designing the last part of the system, I can guarantee that I will have forgotten some of the minor but important decisions that we made in each step of the process. Something would probably blow up as a result. For example, if we decide to make some control signals 5 volt logic, open collector, have a secondary particular function, I may have forgotten exactly how to drive that signal. By the time I'm designing the second half, the thing meant to communicate with the main board, I might have forgotten what that communication was supposed to be. And that could turn into a big mess of reverse engineering my own work to figure out how to proceed. And that sounds dangerous because if I get lazy, I might just start making invalid assumptions about what I think I did and move forward. Sure. It's possible that we could get lucky and design a UPS with a loosely defined architecture. But that's going to be a bumpy road, and the end result will likely be disappointing. If you aren't convinced, check out this playlist where we designed a UPS that fell flat on its face. Good architecture design requires us to sit down, dive into the requirements for the system, and make key decisions about how to proceed. We need to plan out critical interfaces. If we design the interface between the main board and the daughter curds well, now we're talking about something we can take pride in. Those types of actions are what will set us up for success today. Sure, there's still a lot of details to work out, but that's okay. We don't have to have it all figured out right now. If we know that the detailed work is building up parts of an objectively valid architecture, then we know that we're always walking, we're always taking steps in the right direction. It's also great to work this way because defining the critical interfaces up front, defining the parts that help the different modules linked together up front opens up an opportunity for collaboration. If we architect everything well, one person can design the main board, one person can design each power module, four people can work in parallel, never talking to one another about what they're doing, but all making one piece of the system. And it should all come together in the end. That's great news because I hope that when I'm designing the main board, I don't need to understand every minute detail of each of the power modules. I just need to understand the signals coming between them. After all, we do need to design one part of the system first, and failing to do architecture planning will result in making the same key decisions, but we'll be making them on the fly, and we may not realize the significance of each decision that we're making, or how the decision might affect other parts of the system while then making that decision in the context of one module. What this means is that today will be a day filled with big decisions that define how everything connects together. There is not a moment to waste. You're looking at the top level of the architecture. This section of the architecture declares a few key things. First, it decides that there should be a master controller, which is some sort of programmable device. This controller will have control over the two DC inputs, some case fans, and have some digital interfaces for communication. 
This diagram also defines the input voltage to the mainboard. It shows that the DC input should be 24 volts while never exceeding 10 amps. Looks like we have about 240 watts to work with on the DC side of things. Looks good to me so far. We also define the voltage, current, and wattage limits for the two DC buses. There are some critical parameters that we need to know when designing a couple of DC to DC power supplies, and these are the supplies that take the 24 volt input and step that down to 5 and 12 volt power for the main board and modules. We added a maximum power draw and defined that for each of the daughter cards on these rails, and therefore we can define the minimum level of acceptable performance for those two power supplies. This is a part of a larger system power budget, which reserves at least one amp for each module at each voltage. Our high level architecture also defines which of the power buses are bi-directional versus unidirectional. A lot of them just go in one direction, but the 24 volt and the high voltage DC bus can actually be sourced or fed to the daughter cards, depending on whether it's a battery backup or an inverter. The last section here shows the presence of four power modules and those are shown to have 5 kilovolts of isolation from anything accessible to the user while also having an interface back to the master controller. Seems like we're ready to go one level deeper. We talked through every block on the high level. This one's kind of in the middle. This was brainstorming to get down to a low level architecture for the main board. So there's a little bit of overlap. But what we can see, the key differences here, is we can clearly see the current allowed for each voltage provided to the power modules. We can see more detail about the case fan implementation and understand better what power is coming from or being applied to the power modules. I think this one's a little more clear, but it's ultimately saying a lot of the same things. If the diagram, the first one that we talked through, was well understood, nothing here should be a big surprise. So, boring. What's next? The mainboard architecture. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the first actionable diagram. This is the one that gets me excited. I looked at the higher level architecture and I took a stab at defining exactly what that interface should look like. We picked a connector, aiming to repurpose the 164 pin PCIe connector to pass both power and data between the two cards. Now, a PCIe connector isn't typically designed to handle high voltage. So what in the world am I doing? Taking a closer look at our implementation, we're using the short tail of a PCIe connector for power. We're using these 22 pins for providing 24, 12, and 5 volt power to each module. Next comes 14 pins for low voltage connectivity, which carries some uh, UART signals along with some IO, just some serial communication. There are two inputs for enable and synchronization and three outputs that are regular IO, a ready signal and two identification signals. The plan is to use those two identification signals to identify which type of card is installed in each slot. This will tell the master controller whether the module provides battery backup, power input, or power output. This is absolutely critical for the master controller to know right away because it needs to make decisions about prioritization of when to enable each of these devices so there's only one thing sourcing the high voltage DC bus at a time. The identification signal has four possible states so we have one reserved ID, and I plan to use that for when no card is installed. So if the master controller knows which type of device is populated in each slot, it can negotiate the details later via the serial communication link, but it can decide right away what it needs to do to keep itself on. Like, if you power on immediately and the DC bus has failed, maybe we want to just have the battery backup automatically sourcing the 24 volt rail on boot. That might be a thing that we do. And then if the AC power is present, we can switch over to that. Once we get past that low voltage signaling, there's 60 pins of nothing. And that's because there's only a 0.3 millimeter gap between each contact pad on a PCIe card footprint. And this means that in order to have enough total creepage distance, we need to have a lot of these gaps to achieve the total required isolation voltage. That's 30 pins on each side of the PCIe connector. 30 pins worth of gap. My intention is to make these non-plated through holes on the PCB and void the copper fingers in this region, just to add fewer potential pads for leakage current. What follows are a couple pins dedicated to high voltage IO, direct connection to the logic or microcontroller on the daughter card, just gives us the opportunity to break something out to the main board and hook it up if we make a mistake and need to add a little something. This is where we can supply 15 volts and 5 volts to supply the high side microcontroller or gate driver as well. These signals are all referenced to the low side of the DC link, which is isolated from the mains input and the low voltage IO. 
This reference voltage comes next, followed by a shorter gap to make sure the 400 volts applied to the DC bus won't arc across the adjacent finger on the PCIe connector. This is not a safety isolation barrier, it's just how much gap I think we'll need to withstand that 400 volts. So that's the whole interface. That's the interface between the mainboard and the power module. If I missed a signal or two, we have a couple spare pins to work with on the low voltage connectivity side, but I started this for a pretty long time and I'm getting pretty confident that it's all here. I've been debating whether I'm on a master reset signal that can reset all the power modules or not, but that's about the only thing that I might want to add. Zooming out of touch, looking at this from a higher altitude, we can get some detail on the communications interfaces that are available from the master controller to the world. We intend to have an ethernet port for web management, a USB port for direct connection to a computer for automatic shutdown and monitoring, two buttons and an I2C display, along with an RS-232 port and the same two 24 volt DC inputs. Between the four power modules and the main board, the things requiring control on the main board itself, we need a pretty massive quantity of I.O. for the master controller. 62 I.O. And this includes eight serial communication interfaces, seven analog inputs, and 36 general purpose I.O. Wow. Our PSOC 5 is just not going to cut it anymore. We're a little short of connectivity. Thankfully, there's nothing too time critical running here except for the generation of sync pulses. That should give us a lot of options for what this master controller looks like. Everything from Linux running on a Raspberry Pi to an 8-bit microcontroller could probably work. I suspect that we'll be able to set up the sync pulses in some sort of hardware-driven PWM generator and just do that on boot and let them run in lockstep with the master oscillator. At least that's the dream. Makes software timing a lot less critical for that master controller. That is the first main nugget of this architecture. That is step one. This gets a defined interface between the main board and the power modules. This gives us enough detail to press forward with confidence. I don't know about you, but seeing these architecture drawings gets me really excited. It's like I can see it. I can see the architecture for the first time. I can see the system and I think this is crazy enough that it just might work. It might not be the most exciting video for everyone, but it is the most critical step in any project. It just didn't feel right to gloss over such an important detail of a design process while capturing the rest of the project. We captured two huge steps forward today. We defined the high level architecture for the 2400 watt UPS and we built a detailed architecture diagram for the main board. If you're excited to see this project keep blazing forward, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos where we will walk through the detailed architecture of the PFC module and design the mains input filter for the PFC power module. I think this architecture will lead to a great system. If you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, following us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone. Thanks for staying till the end. Bye.